All right, let me get the lights adjusted. And there we go. All right, welcome to week eight of our freshman engineering seminar. It looks like you all made it through midterms. Congratulations. Um, real quick, uh, a few uh, uh, announcements for the week. Um, so engineering, and, and I say engineering, but this is going to be a, a number of organizations, uh, the, the civil engineering organization, SAME, ASD, the mechanicals, as well as Theta Ta are organizing a homecoming tailgate outside the, uh, the Weisberg Engineering Lab building. So um, everybody know the old building right next to the new complex. Uh, they'll be out there. I think they're going to have food and stuff. So if you want uh, to go ahead and uh, check that out, that's fine. Uh, don't forget your meeting schedule. Remember the uh, uh, SAME ASC chapter meetings are every other Tuesday, and the mechanicals are having their meetings every other Monday. Um, now, real quick, got to admit, I did forget to uh, give Patrick the sign-in sheets uh, earlier this week, so you all probably noticed they weren't there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, have those printed off during class and just sign them on your way out. I won't count anybody late, so, you know, sound good? So I'll remind you when uh, class is ending to sign out before you leave, but I'll have a bunch of them there in the back. Just uh, sign out before you leave. Sound good? Okay. So pattern as usual, we're going to have a, a main speaker uh, and then a faculty introduction. Uh, a little bit about our main speaker. He is also a graduate of Marshall Eng Marshall's engineering program. So he is proof that you can get past us crazy professors. Um, he works for the Nick J. Rahal Appalachian Transportation Institute. So he's going to tell you a little bit of uh, work inside that field. But first off, we're going to have a faculty uh, introduce themselves. Our faculty for this week uh, is Dr. Richard Begley. So I'm going to turn the floor over to him. Everybody give him a round of applause. Does this work? Yeah, and I'll get it loaded for you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Marshall. A couple of things I hope you'll remember. I'm the oldest professor here. I got the worst jokes. For example, if somebody wears green and white, where have they been? Marshall University. Somebody wears blue and gold. Where have they been? Walmart. <laughs> he was in my class before. Uh, so I hope, hope to come back to that. At one point, I was the only engineering professor here, full time, and I'm very delighted to be working with the other faculty that we have here. Although our faculty meetings are much harder to get through these days. All right. Uh, there's a little bit about where I've been. A.S., M.S., B.S., Ph.D., uh, a little stuff, a little stuff, more stuff, all R and D. Uh, sometimes they use a different word for S, but I won't go there. Uh, my background is in mine engineering. used to work in the coal mines. I spent more time underground than I did on the ground at, at one point. Our, our program is very multidisciplinary. It's a combination of civil, mechanical, electrical, SAP, and also environmental. So I know a little bit about a lot, but not a lot about anything. Jack of all trade, master of none. Uh, expertise, swap mechanics and geology. That's uh, what I spent a lot of time in when I was in your shoes studying. Yes, I think rocks are interesting, uh, believe it or not. Explosive engineering, I know how to blow them up. Um, so we, I'm, I may be adding that class here at some point. Computer modeling and simulation, Dr. Michael and I talked about some FEA stuff, uh, very exciting technology, software. Simulation, been involved in many of those in, in, in my day. Transportation, mainly uh, railroad emphasis. Energy, also uh, part of the things I work in, particularly fuel extraction and supply. And of course, environmental safety is very important. What's real important, uh, besides the last topic there, GIS, GPS, geographical information systems, mobile positioning systems. The well, GPS I work with is not the one you buy from Walmart. It's uh, very expensive. Delivers coordinate information uh, accurate to a centimeter, which is about the size of your thumb, and we use it for very, very precise uh, surveys. But what's important is remember rocks rock. If you have any questions about rock, how to keep it from falling on your head. Or if you want to blow it up, I'm your man. All right, so a little bit of the, the profile 
30 years in higher ed, believe it or not. And one of the things I do try to uh, suggest uh, is that we are building a relationship. And there's been many times I've worked with my students in the past, and I've worked with my former professors. And believe it or not, some of them are still alive. Um, so I do hope that uh, as your career develops, there may be some projects that uh, we'll find ben beneficial to work together. Uh, I've got a handful of patents. Uh, the one for Canada was the first one uh, in Marshall's history. Had six years of land in the power, fuel supply, coal mine here that was last century. There's some of the things I consult on, mine safety, but there will be environmental remediation, court cases, uh, rubber mapping inspections, product development commercialization. So a couple of recent rocket projects, working on a uh, dust filtration system for underground equipment. Over on the left is a piece of equipment. It's underground. Uh, right on top there is the roof. It's about six feet between the floor and the roof, and what you can see up there in the white, coal mines are not blocked, they're, they're white from powdered limestone that's sprayed on the roof. To, uh, the dust and filtrate. But there's a rock bolt in the roof up there, if you can make it out. If I knew how to work a laser pointer, I'd point it out to you. Uh, does this have a pointer on it? Yeah. Right there? So there's a pattern of holes in that rock to keep it from falling. And there's also a city, but there's where uh, uh, an individual offers this piece of equipment operates it, and we're building a system that's going to take out the air uh, that this operator receives as it transports the coal from where it's extracted to where it's loaded. So here's a, another picture underground. Uh, I'm about six foot high, so there's a you know, six foot of space there. There's a, the rock that keeps it from falling on our head. That's what these rock mechanics people do. There's a bolt that's uh, drilled and anchored into the roof. And there's also a beam there that helps keep that opening stable. So we have perhaps 20 feet of width between here and the other, other wall. I guess the most important thing here is there I am. I'm in between the two pretty girls. Uh, also, she's the director of STEM education. She's one of our safety professors. And there's Dr. Colum, who's our chair. He's done a little bit of a job. Here at Marshall, and we're very, very fortunate to have him. All right, uh, another project, rail grade uh, management. There's a Changes in elevation uh, again of a
it is. I welcome the chance to meet each of you. I've had a chance to meet some of you already. I look forward to seeing you in future classes. Uh, welcome questions. I'm going to turn it over to our main speaker. Again, if you uh, came in a couple minutes late, no worries. Uh, I'm going to get the sign-in sheets taken care of before the end of business. Just sign them as you leave. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our main speaker. So everybody, let's give a round of applause for Mr. Odello. All right, how are you guys doing today? Uh, as he said, my name is Michael Adello. I am a graduate of the Marshall University uh, Engineering Program. I graduated way back in 2010, which doesn't sound like a long time ago. But to put that into context, when I graduated, we were the second graduating class of that engineering program. There were 15 of us. Uh, there's over 100 of you guys in, that, in this room. Uh, so that tells you how much the program has grown. A little more context, when I started out, there wasn't just an old engineering building and a new engineering building. There were zero engineering buildings. So parking was not an issue when I started out because all of that was a parking lot. But we had zero uh, buildings. We were in the basement of Gullickson, if you've ever been down there. Uh, if you haven't, I don't recommend going down there. It's not a fun place to be. But we had one classroom, uh, four professors, two of which who have since retired. One is your dean, and the other is Andrew Nichols. Uh, who is my boss. I started working with him my junior year at the Ray Hall Transportation Institute. We abbreviated RTI to keep it shorter, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so it's, again, putting that in context, how far this program has come. It's amazing to see every year I'm here. It's always really exciting to see that. Uh, so intelligent transportation systems, that's what we're going to touch on a little bit today. Uh, how does that fit in a civil engineering? What is it? How does that look within West Virginia, and then specifically at RTI, what we're working on? And then I'll touch on the Huntington Signal project that we had a hand in and the future of ITS. So I think when Dr. Nichols was here, he went through this a little bit, so I'll, I'll quickly breeze through it. But again, civil engineering is very broad, and you can drill down pretty deep within that. So within that, you've got all these disciplines. Transportation engineering is kind of where I reside, specifically highway engineering, traffic engineering, and air on that side, and then we'll break that down a little bit more. So intelligent transportation systems and traffic signal design and management are my two main areas of focus. But again, broad spectrum is civil engineering, but when you drill down all the way down to traffic engineering, you can break that down even further. Um, and that's the case with every discipline within civil engineering. Um, so keeping that in mind. And I'm sure you guys will continue to hear about that from all the professors that come in this year and all the speakers. So. Way back in 1998, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, this is kind of what our road, roadway system looked like. Now, again, these are all of your highways, your interstates. These are not smaller roads. But green is good. Green is below capacity. Red is bad, exceeding capacity. So you can see within all of the cities, of course, New York City, California, L.A., they were exceeding capacity. But pretty much everywhere else, we were doing okay. But what they did is they, they were trying to look ahead and see, see where are we going. And so this is their projection for 2020. So as you can see, at that point, we're not going to be doing very good. And amazingly enough, we're getting very close to 2020, and we are approaching this. So they said, this is not good. You know, what is the problem? What is going on here? What's causing this? Well, we've got all of these extra vehicles entering into our highway system, but we're not building additional roads. We don't have the money for additional roads, we, and we don't have the space for additional roads. And, and so they said, what can we do to fix that? And so that is when the ITS, or the Intelligent Transportation System program, was kind of born out of. They said, we can't fix this by building new roadways. We have to become more efficient using technology. So. Um, intelligent transportation systems is the use of communications-based information and electronic technologies to improve safety, improve mobility, enhance productivity, increase security, and it's made up of systems that focus on intelligent vehicles, intelligent infrastructure, and then the integration of those two parts together. So we'll break that down a little bit and get into the specifics of what that looked like. But some of the programs that came out of that. Uh, next generation 911, so further integrating that into um, 
getting that information where it needs to go quicker. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, congestion, corridor management, we deal a little bit with. Uh, emergency transportation operations. The National 511 program was stemmed from the ITS objective. So all of the, you can call 511, there's 511 websites. That's now in 49 states. The 50th state has decided they're not going to participate at all. Um, to give you some context on West Virginia and kind of where we fall into that, we were the 47th out of the 49th state to develop a 511 program. So that kind of shows you, again, West Virginia, we're always kind of a step behind. We're always a little bit slower on the uptake. And that was absolutely true uh, within the area of ITS. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So this is kind of an overall big picture view of ITS. Again, everything is communicating to everything else. That's the end goal. We're not there yet. But the idea is everything is saying, this is where I'm at. This is where you're at. How do we interact together? And how can we keep that a safe environment? Sharing of information. So in West Virginia, the ITS program was established in 2006. And they started deploying things in 2007. Some of what that entailed uh, is what we call our RWIS, Roadway Weather Information Systems, DMS, those dynamic message signs. I've got a few pictures of these. Uh, CCTV, integration with the county 911 centers, uh, and again, the 511 system. Uh, the objective was to detect incidents and notify responders in the public quicker. And primarily, it was primarily focused on the interstate and other four-lane corridors. Again, you've got to start big picture and then bring that down to the smaller roadways. So again, the RWIS systems, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's a very small, but that is basically a little hockey puck sized device within a roadway, and you get all this information out of it. It gives you the temperature of the roadway, gives you the condition of the roadway, is it wet, is it dry? Um, so just a little bit to see, we're not out there, what are the conditions of the roadway? Um, the CCTV cameras, which you can see up there, and they'll give you a, a true time image of what's going on. Uh, dynamic message signs, again, you can put a message out to them. And so all of that information is coming back to the Traffic Management Center. So this was established in 2008 in Charleston, West Virginia. Um, it's in the Capitol building there where the central office for the DOH is. It is operational 24-7. So 24 hours a day, those calls from the 911 centers are coming in. They're, obs they're observing all of those CCTV cameras. They're observing the roadway information sensors. And, they're set, and then they're funneling that information out to the public through the 511 system and through those dynamic message signs. And so if you go to, if you get bored later, um, you can go to westvirginia511.org. And this is the view that you will see. So all of this information is real time. So you've got the traffic, which is all green because we live in West Virginia and we hardly ever see congestion, which is nice, um, but if you live in a city, it's totally different. So this would look different for them. Um, you can look at construction, planned events, upcoming events, incidents that they are aware of. That's the red crashes. It looks like this was a very bad day. That was yesterday. So uh, if you were on the roadway, you may have experienced some delays. Uh, all of the active signs, the dynamic message signs, all of the cameras, you can actually go in there and you can pull up all of those CCT, CCTV cameras if you want um, and just observe the roadway. You can't move it around. Within the Traffic Management Center, they can move those cameras around. But you, as an observer, you can, it's kind of creepy. You can go in there and, and look at interstate traffic just traveling on, along if you want to. Um, and again, those, those weather devices are also in there. So all of that information is available to you as a public. Um, which is, again, it's all to help you plan your trip better. Where are there incidents? Where are there delays? How can I more efficiently move from point A to point B? So some of the challenges within West Virginia, as we know, uh, our communications infrastructure, again, we're a bit behind the times. We are not always the quickest to do things. Uh, we got 4G five years after everyone else did. We got 3G five years after everyone else did. Uh, geography, we have a lot of mountains, which again does not help our communications infrastructure. Uh, funding, we are traditionally one of the lower funded states, so that is always a challenge. Decision making, um, again, we were kind of stuck in our way. We were saying, we, we've always done it this way, why do we want to change? What is the benefit of doing this differently? Uh, and what that all led to was a reactive versus a proactive approach. 
So they would react to an incident, they would react to an issue and then fix it rather than proactively looking at it and saying, what can we do to better plan for the future? How can we prevent these incidents? How can we prevent these issues on our roadways? And so with, within RTI, uh, within the state, we're trying to help flip that philosophy into a proactive approach rather than a reactive one. Um, so ITS in the future within West Virginia, additional devices, integrations of additional 911 centers, continually evolving technology integration. So that is a big one because, again, technology never stops moving. It never is done evolving. And so that creates, that's great, but it's also like every year something is different. And so continually integrating that and then the maintenance of the existing infrastructure. Infrastructure is great if you put it out there, but if you don't touch it for the next five years, half of it's not working and then your system is back to square one. So keeping that in mind. Uh, within RTI, what does ITS look like? So we, um, we house and host the centralized traffic signal system uh, management software for the DOH. Uh, so this is a picture of the transportation lab in the new engineering building. Uh, it's room 2301. If you guys ever get bored, you can stop by. It's right by Dr. Michelson's office, which I'm sure you guys have all been to. Uh, I'm sure you visit him frequently, although I'm guessing not. He's, he's never busy. Uh, I'm kidding. But anyways, so what this started out with, unfortunately, was a project in Morgantown for that other university. Uh, but that's how we got started was 25 intersections. The DOH came to us and said, can you help us with this? We're going to, we're going to implement this system, but we need help. We need your expertise. So it started there. Uh, then we added Huntington was the next big system. Charleston was last year. And then we've got a few smaller systems in Taze Valley, St. Albans, Elkins. Um, and now we have a project to help assist them with their entire signal system, which is approximate, approximately 1,300 signals across the state. So we are responsible for uh, retiming those signals, and we'll get into what that entails. But I like to tell people my job is to get you from point A to point B as quickly as possible, which everyone enjoys because we all want our time. We're all very time-oriented, uh, and we don't, we're impatient people, if we're being honest. So looking at traffic signal systems and what it entails to retime a system or to, again, get you from point A to point B a little bit quicker. So in Huntington, this was circa 2000, I got to get my dates right here. Um, this would have been 2012 or 2013, so before. This is the before picture. There's about 118 signals within Huntington, give or take. Uh, there were 10 systems, quote unquote, but they weren't really operating as systems uh, because, again, that, the hardware was no longer useful, the infrastructure, and there was no communications between these signals. Um, and as you can see, the majority of everything was installed in 1989. So again, that's basically a 15 to 20 year window in which it was not touched. So some of the issues that we saw, the, the detection wasn't working, outdated signal timings, and again, just the maintenance issues. Um, so how bad were they operating? Well, this is a travel time. You're going from 31st Street to 1st Street. So from the Ohio Bridge all the way down to 1st Street. And as you can see, the ideal travel time is approximately 300 seconds. So that is going at the speed limit, not hitting a red light, which as we know is somewhat unrealistic, but that is the ideal goal. And we were seeing two to four minutes of delay on average for every vehicle, and that's for every trip through that corridor. So you can imagine how that adds up over time. If you're incurring four minutes of delay every day, every day of the week, you can add, you can do the math if you guys really want to, but all of the time that you're losing throughout the year. And so the DOT came in um, and they renovated 59 signals from 31st Street to 5th Street. This is all of them pictured. Uh, so they didn't cross the viaduct at 8th Avenue. Um, 3.67 million or 62,000 per intersection. So again, we, we were talking about the funding issues earlier. That's part of the reason. This is not a cheap process. Everyone looks at a traffic signal and they don't see all of the dollar signs involved in it. But this is what it costs to start from scratch is about sixty to seventy thousand dollars per intersection. Uh, and again, that's completely starting from scratch, inc including all the steel poles, which really add up. Uh, so, what is in a traffic signal? What makes it work? And then again, how do we factor that in? So, 
On the right side, that is a typical traffic signal cabinet. You may not have ever pay, paid attention to it, but on every, on the, one of the corners of an intersection, hanging on a pole or on the ground, is a traffic signal cabinet. And if you open it up, that's what it's going to look like. It looks like a lot of wires, and it is a lot of wires. And I'm not going to tell you what every wire does, but what's most important is this up here, or this here. It's called a traffic signal controller. So basically, that is the thing that says, you go green now, you go red. Uh, you go yellow, all of that. It's basically a miniature computer in there, and that has to be programmed in order for the traffic signal to work. It doesn't just work on, it on its own. It's not just a simple process, but we'll get into that a little bit. Another component is detection. So you'll see occasionally, uh, these are called inductive loops. You'll see them cut into the roadway. You probably always thought they were random, but there is actually a purpose for them. They magnetically say, is there a car here, yes or no? If the magnetic field is enabled, it's yes. If it's not, it's no. There's video cameras, um, which their output, you'll see these in Huntington at most of the intersections. And this is kind of the interface of what it looks like within the software for the traffic, or for the traffic camera. And then there's also, this is the newest technology, it's radar technology. And you'll see these, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but the newer project in Huntington uh, is up on 20th Street, so you'll see these installed up there. And the difference between those and video cameras, these are not affected by weather, so fog and snow are really bad um, for traffic cameras because they can't differentiate what is fog, what is snow, what is a vehicle. And so, especially in West Virginia, that can become quite an issue. So the DOH now is, is moving more towards radar. Uh, when it first came out, it was a very expensive technology, but now it's pretty much comparable two video cameras, so there's no reason not to use them, basically. So, all that being said, you've got all these components, and this is a very confusing diagram, but I'll try to break it down for you a little bit. So, within the traffic signal cabinet, you've got your controller, you've got, this is called a conflict monitor, you've got your signal heads, your detection, your pedestrian heads, all of that is in that cabinet. And that is going to a switch, and then that is going out toward a radio, and that radio is com communicating back to what we call a main intersection. And so at that main intersection, all of the other intersections are, are communicating back towards it, saying this is my status, this is what's going on in real time. Because again, the controller is providing real time data and it is saying this phase is green, this phase is red, this is my exact status at this point. And that goes out through the radio into the main intersection radio and then that is piped through a router out to the internet. And this is where it gets a little confusing and a little tricky. But within Taze Valley, we have, uh, there's a server. And on that server, in the cloud, is housed our traffic signal management software. And so we can, I can log into any computer sitting anywhere in the entire world. And I can go into the cloud, and I can look at that traffic signal management software. And this is, if you guys ever want to stop by, we've got this up on display in the lab. And I can tell you a little bit more about it. But basically, I can click on an intersection, and I can say what is going on right now at that traffic signal. And it's basically about a one-second delay. So that's pretty incredible to realize I can do that. Now, in a, I live in Huntington, so it's not a big deal for me to go out to a traffic signal and say, what's going on here? But imagine that Morgantown system, again, that was the first one we implemented, three hours away. In the old days, I would have had to get in my car, drive to Morgantown, and say, what is the problem here? What is going on? But now I can sit at my computer, I can log into that system, and I can pull it up and look at it real time and see, OK, what is going on? So if I get a complaint, if I get a call, someone saying, I sat here for four minutes waiting on the light to change, I can log in. And I can usually say, no, you didn't. Your estimation of time is completely off because you just don't want to wait for 30 seconds. But in the old days, I would have had to make a three-hour trip there and a three-hour trip back. So I'm very thankful for it. Uh, it allows me to be lazy and just sit at the computer all day uh, and save time on my end, which I enjoy. And so this is the interface of what that looks like. So again, these are all of our traffic signals. This is the real-time view. And this view actually is the exact same view that if you were to go out to the traffic signal cabinet and look at the traffic signal controller, uh, this bottom portion here, and the traffic signal controller, it's not colored, it's black and white, but it's the exact same thing that you would see in the field. So that's pretty incredible. Um, and again, that's all through the wireless communications coming back and piping out through the internet. 
so we, what we did within Huntington, uh, we were looking at two primary corridors, obviously 3rd Avenue and 5th Avenue. It is a little bit easier uh, to get people from point A to point B in a one-way one road system, but we also looked at secondary corridors of 20th Street, 16th, 10th, and 8th, obviously where all the viaducts are, where your crossing traffic comes in. And so that's where it becomes interesting is because you have this interaction of, I want to get cars all the way down 5th Avenue, but I also want traffic to be able to flow through 20th Street. And so that's where this retiming of traffic signals becomes a bit of a Rubik's Cube. Because you change one thing on one side, it's going to affect everything else over here. So it becomes a how do I best satisfy every customer because you guys aren't really customers, it's more of a consumer. But the point is it is never going to be a perfect system, but that's also why I enjoy it. Is no signal system is the same. My job is never the same on Monday as it is on Tuesday if I'm looking at two different traffic signal systems. Um, so that being said, how did we do? Uh, well, as you can see, blue is travel time before, red is travel time afterwards. Um, so we reduced total delay by 25%, but the bigger issue is we re reduced that variation by 75%. So now you can consistently drive down 3rd Avenue, you know what you're going to get. Um, you can do the same thing down 5th and hopefully 20th as well. And so the estimated user benefits, $1.7 million per year, is 6800 a day. Those are all based on how much your time is worth to the average person. So they're not real numbers per se, but it, it does give you an idea of we've saved people time and they value that time. Um, and it is a substantial amount. So what our role was, again, we, do, we host that traffic signal management software. Uh, we did design and program the signal timings. And we're going to con we continually monitor the maintenance of the system, and we're continually fine tuning it. Uh, we're not we're not just doing that for Huntington. We're doing that again across the state. Yesterday, I was in Beckley, West Virginia. Is anyone in here from Beckley by chance? Okay, you know Harper Road. Harper Road's a nightmare. Yeah. So I was on Harper Road yesterday. But anyway, so again, my job in Huntington and Beckley are two different jobs. I'm doing the same thing, but every system is unique, and so it's always enjoyable. Um, for the most part. So again, Huntington, we're not done or we don't want to be done because again, every traffic signal system is different and we want them all to be integrated. This year, they actually just completed, so these four blue intersections and these three over here in Guide Dot, those are the new system that they just added and so that is integrated into the existing system here. And again, that's where they have those white radar detection. They're actually not white there, sorry, they're black, but they're up on the the signal head, so if you ever see those as you drive by, that's radar detection versus the video cameras that you see. Uh, a big question I always get, speaking of those video cameras, everyone always asks if they are red light cameras. They are not, just so you know, and I probably shouldn't tell you this, but legally there has to be a sign displayed saying that, that red light cameras are in effect. So if you never see that sign, you can legally run a red light as long as there's not a cop behind you and not get caught, but I don't recommend it. It doesn't really help anyone. Uh, but you're, you're not going to get a ticket from any of those cameras, so just so you know. So the future of ITS, where is this going? Um, again, all of the technology is really going towards, as you guys know, the driverless cars, the autonomous vehicles, all of that. That, that is the end goal. Um, the proof of concept was achieved years ago, but really kind of fine-tuning that. And the bigger part is the vehicle to the infrastructure communication. And so some of the challenges that you guys may not think about or that they're really trying to overcome now is it's all great that a vehicle can drive itself, but a vehicle cannot read a sign. A vehicle cannot look at a traffic signal and say, is that green or red? Uh, innately, those are all challenges that must be overcome, but there's also dynamic issues within that. For example, a construction zone, that is not a normal event. So that, there must be some way for that to be communicated to a vehicle. As a user driving a vehicle, you read the sign, you say, okay, I must slow down or I must get over a lane, but for an autonomous or a driverless vehicle, that's a whole different set of, whole different set of issues, not to mention crashes that occur randomly. They must be able to adjust to those. And then I was just talking, I think Dr. Michelson and I were actually talking the other day, all of this is based on communication. All of this, this is based on an infrastructure in place. 
But all of that requires power. And so in the event of a power outage, like, what does that look like? What is the backup system for these vehicles to say, okay, I'm required to get information from this traffic signal, otherwise I'm not going to know what to do. If that traffic signal doesn't have power, what does that look like? So those are some of the, the weird, quirky questions that come up uh, and that you have to think about and that they're really trying to overcome. Uh, one thing they're doing right now, it's called a smart city. They just awarded that to Columbus, Ohio, actually. So pretty close to here, three hours away. And they, the Federal Highway Administration has committed $40 million to them over the next three to 10 years, depending on how long it takes. But they basically said, prove that this can work. Prove that there can exist a city in which everything can communicate, everything can work together without issues, safely, basically. And so that, that is one big, huge push that they're making right now. But again, not every city has $40 million just laying around, or not every city is going to be awarded $40 million. And so even though the technology is there, we are still a long time away from making all of that work together in a safe environment. So keeping that in mind. Uh, that being said, I'll take any questions if you guys have them. If not, I understand that it's lunchtime and you want to get out of here. So.